What's up guys? So today we had an amazing conversation with this guy from TikTok named The Local Theistic Nuisance, which you'll hear more about in the show. But I do want to warn you, I don't know what was going on with that microphone, but in post, I realized that I sound really bad in the video. So just ignore that part. He has a lot of good things to say. Derry's microphone sounds great. So sorry about the low quality. Uh, we're going to work on that. Fix it. But yeah, this is definitely an episode that's worth listening into. So stay tuned. Interestingly, I'm going to push back on like a lot of that, like Ooh, coming fun. from a different from a different space. Like, um, well, mm-hmm. I guess to, to kind of finish the answer to that tough question, it's like God made us free. We have free will. Yeah. And, you know, like a Calvinist can't answer that objection, <laughs> which is why I'm not a Calvinist. They can, and, but it's just not very good. It's like an answer. We can just say, I'm just lucky, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like they can't like they don't have a satisfactory answer to that objection i should say like some like i'm not gonna what's up everybody welcome back to the things you don't hear in church podcast my name is ethan and my name is Derry. and today we have an awesome guest tate medina he is the uh the founder the host of a tiktok channel um called the local theistic nuisance he's got a great tiktok channel he does a lot of conversations reaction videos and topical videos on christianity apologetics um, a lot about abortion and atheism as well. And we wanted to have him on today to sort of have a back and forth about the American church and atheism and how they sort of are conflicting with each other. Of course, they conflict, but um, stuff around that topic. So yeah, everybody welcome our awesome guest, Tate. Tate, is there anything else you want to say about uh, yourself? How do you do? Um, yeah, I <laughs> check, out my, check out my TikTok. I, I talk about things on TikTok you know, I, I basically give a comprehensive and complete defense of the Christian faith and everything surrounding it in under three minutes, and nobody can stop me. <laughs> He's unstoppable. <laughs> yeah, and I like how your videos are shot, too. Like, a lot of the, the pinned ones you have, even um, before they were pinned, too, like your resurrection one and stuff, are, are really great. I really like them. Yeah, I, I really... I, I made that resurrection one on like a, on like a whim. Sometimes like I have an idea brewing for a long time and I'm thinking about mm-hmm. it. And then I like, like, I like thoughtfully put together the video that resurrection one. I was like, okay, it's Holy Saturday, Easter tomorrow. I'm just gonna, uh, I've got enough points in my head. I'm going to go for it. And I just, I just did it. Nice. And I was like, wow, the lighting's really great in my room. And like, I don't yeah. know, God, God go. decided that the stars aligned that day. <laughs> That one got a little over a hundred thousand views, and that's wow, okay. really fantastic. It's, yeah, so, it how sick. long does it take you to like make a TikTok? Oh I find my gosh, we do it, way, it's like thirty minutes. It takes way longer than I thought it would. Like, because hmm. I, I'm pretty picky about like, how, like my videos and my my content quality and stuff like that. So, like, hmm. I use when I was like a teenager, like a young teenager, I made just like YouTube videos, like gaming YouTube videos, never went anywhere. Like my most popular video had like 800 views. And I was like, whoa, dude, 800 (laughs) people watch this. And it was horrible. But, you know, (laughs) maybe that like gave me, took me away from some of like the camera shyness. It Hmm. Like my older brother went to school for like video editing and stuff like that. So he would help mm. me with stuff. So I just, I have, mm. maybe I have some of the intuitions, but I get picky. So it'll take me like two hours for a three minute video, wow. at least two hours. Like, wow. and that's, and sometimes TikTok, it's weird. It'll just delete your thing for no reason, or yeah. it'll undo all of your edits when you're selecting yeah. the thumbnail for your video. And then you have to go back and start from scratch. But no, Dang. I, I really enjoyed it. I, yeah. Yeah, I found uh, there'll be times where I'll be hanging out and I'll be like, I'm gonna make a TikTok. I got a little bit of time. And I have this thought, like you're saying, like thoughts brewing for a little bit. Or I'll see like a TikTok that was terrible and I'll be like, I have to make a reply to this. This is damaging people's faith. And um, so I'll like try to make something and then I'll be there for like way longer than I expected. I was like, bro, this is a one minute video. What is happening? Like, why is it taking so long? (laughs) Yeah, it's surprisingly user friendly when it comes to like editing, but still, it can be right. difficult. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Tate, how did you get started on TikTok and making like apologetic kind of content? 
Well, so I guess uh, if we want to like take a step further back, like I've been, I was raised Christian my whole life and I kind of grew up not thinking about atheism too that hard. I didn't really think about Mm -hmm. atheism all that much. You know, I kind of grew up like with a pretty intellectual style faith. My dad has kind of like a hidden talent that like he doesn't bring out for anybody like he's Mm. extremely smart and thoughtful in like in a a kind of like apologetics way instructing in the faith and stuff like that like Mm -hmm. so if I ever had a question I was always under the impression that like there was an answer you know Mm -hmm. and it didn't really matter how like naughty the question was or how like difficult or like deep the question was like there was or there was always just a kind of tacit understanding in the back of my mind like there's a christian answer to this mm. and i didn't really think about atheism too much until um until i met like my girlfriend you know she has she comes from a christian background but like she started off when we were first dating kind of like pretty agnostic kind of really skeptical of the christian faith and she just started like leveling these like these really thoughtful criticisms that I'd never really thought about or heard before, or didn't really know how to answer. Mm. And it just started to like, you know, it planted a little something in the back of my head. So I would start to study like theology. Like I'd follow podcasts, like on the, uh, the Catholic Bishop, Robert Barron has a podcast mm. where he talks about theology. And like, I would just listen to that nonstop while I was at work. Cause they let me use earbuds. So I just, I, I listened to it and I loved it. And I just would nonstop listen to it. And like, just, I'd start to come to the realization that, yeah, there are, there are a lot of atheists, aren't there? And that's not really Mm -hmm. like normal, historically speaking, like this is kind of unprecedented. Very abnormal. So, you know, I started just like being like, okay, I, I like this apologetic stuff. And at the same time, I started to teach uh, like catechesis at my local church So it was also helpful to just keep studying theology. Now I ended up dropping that just because like the program didn't end up really like being super friendly to not necessarily what I was trying to do. Like I had a better vision, but it was just like, I come from like, uh, my parish is more like a Spanish speaking community. So the accommodations they made for like English speaking class was just, it wasn't the same. There was just a language barrier, you know? Mm. So it just didn't end up working out, but Anyways, I started to notice um, like the, the rise in atheism, like on the internet, like, you know, it's been going on for a while now, but like I became particularly interested in like the deconstruction movement and the ex-evangelical movement on TikTok. Right. And I got drawn specifically to Abraham Piper, the hmm. son right. of the theologian, John Piper. Right. John Piper. Kind of, yeah. He's like a big deconstruction yeah. type he was an early pioneer i feel like of that community that space on tiktok yeah exactly yeah. and like i i think i had i'd seen like a news uh article about him and i was like okay uh, fine i'll get tiktok it seems like this is where my generation of like people who are like falling away from belief or deconstructing their faith or becoming atheist that's where they are that's where they're mm-hmm. having these discussions that's where this is happening and i was kind of surprised like TikTok is a decent way to like engage yeah intellectually in comparison to other places like Twitter or Facebook or Mm. Reddit. I don't know if you are around YouTube, like in YouTube's really early days, but YouTube used to be a place where you could post a video and you could actually post video responses to that video and people would have conversations in the comments. And it's so interesting that like YouTube got rid of that in the very early stages. And that's just what TikTok has become. It's so interesting. It's fantastic is what it is because a lot of times what people do to respond to videos is they stitch it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what that does is it enables people who are in an echo chamber to click that little original video button and step outside of their echo chamber and just see what the original video was all about. Yep. Yeah. I've noticed that there's another perspective. Yeah. I've noticed a lot of the videos that we posted when we do stitches like that they get a lot more views than maybe other videos we do because it gets that community that's in that that one, at least that echo chamber. 
you know and so it's exactly. just, i like it because it's really strategic you're like oh you think you're watching this but you just wait like mm-hmm. five more seconds <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's awesome juke them yeah mm-hmm. so you started off and you you started like getting into that kind of content on tiktok and then you started making videos yourself or, or how did it how did it come to this yeah i kind of like intentionally like got tiktok for the purpose of making videos and like okay. my girlfriend you know raised the thoughtful critique which is tate you're not going to change anybody's mind on here like you know these people like you're not going to make a video and then suddenly go oh my gosh i'm not an atheist anymore mm-hmm. and like by and large that's true you know like sometimes it's like hey you never know like yeah. You never know what's going to start a seed of like thought in someone's head Absolutely. that mm-hmm. blossoms into a tree of faith later. But like by and large, the purpose of my TikTok is to essentially like be an ambassador for like uh, an intellectually like rich mm-hmm. version of the Christian faith. So yeah. as it seems like the more I listen to people who are deconstructing their faith, ex-evangelicals, they're coming from a place of hearing in church, essentially that you should check your brain at the door. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I've heard that. Before. I, yeah, I want to, uh, you know, it's never usually like that line. Cause that's a little, like ugh, a little, right. a little culty, even for like yeah. the little old lady, but <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But like, I kind of wanted to just be like, no, 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 God, God gave you a brain. Like Christianity makes sense. There's, yeah, there are, mm-hmm. there are you you to love extremely, them with it too. yeah, there's an extremely old that goes right back to the start intellectual tradition within mm-hmm. Christianity that is, that is thought about every question, every question that anybody on like the deconstruction atheism Mm -hmm. internet space has ever thought of it's not to like put them down or anything or call them like dumb they're great questions but Mm -hmm. the idea that like ah checkmate christians you've never thought of this one have you we thought of it about two thousand years ago right yeah right yeah that's how every like deconstructionist video starts it's so interesting yeah well just because you're going to tell you this one yeah yeah to your that's that point like oh we get that point like you don't have this answer i was literally thinking about that this morning when we were like kind of prepping for the show and just thinking about it i was like you know a lot of the questions people have I, a lot of church fathers wrestled with an answer too you know like for instance like the problem of evil is not new we, we've had this for a very long time and they've had an answer for it for a very long time since humans have been alive the the answer the, the answer to the problem of evil is older than christianity it's in the book of right. Job. yeah, yeah. What's yeah. really interesting to me is that I'll find, and I was shocked by this because I don't know, like, and I guess this is something that is worth talking about as well, like later when it comes to like maybe criticisms of the Christian community and how it's kind mm-hmm. of generating unbelief. But like what shocked me was the amount of like TikTok atheists and people deconstructing their faith, skeptics, unbelievers um using the book of job as like an example of god's cruelty right. and like trying to like exaggerate <clears throat> the problem of evil or like the problem of this is the god that you worship it's right. it's really interesting to me that people can read the book of job and reach the opposite conclusion that like christians for centuries had been coming to with it yeah yeah mm-hmm. I, I know i think that is is because there is this and this is a theory, but there is this like level of atheists, like popularity that kind of came about maybe five to seven years ago, um, kind mm-hmm. of with like the rise of Bart Ehrman. And in like when in Bart's like main book about um, like why he stopped being a Christian, why he stopped being a progressive Christian after he kind of lost his faith in the Bible, um, it was the problem of evil. And he specifically cites the book of Job and like a large part of his book on why he left Christianity. Um, is about the problem of evil within the book of Job. And so I think that's why a lot of people reference it on TikTok because a lot of like the new atheists really, really like Bart um, and a lot of his books. And so that's where yeah, I was assuming they got a lot of his ideas from. He's slowly becoming like the new Dawkins or the new Hitchens. And yeah. like much love and respect to Bart Ehrman because like he, some of his insights are very helpful. 
He, oh yeah. He, he will join us in the crusade against Jesus mythicists, people who right. believe that Jesus never <laughs> existed at all, which right. is like a cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs kind of like conspiracy right. theory that has gained so much traction. So much popularity. Yeah. It's, it's mm-hmm. really shocking. And so I appreciate that Bart will join us in that and say, no, Jesus was a real person upon whom the Christian faith is founded. You right. know, I think that he, like he wasn't God, which, you right. know, but when it comes to like his criticisms of like New Testament reliability, oh my goodness. Like I used to put stock in it until I actually read like scholars who affirm like original authorship of the mm-hmm. gospels and like, mm-hmm. uh, an early mm-hmm. dating of the gospels and i read their arguments and in com- in contrast with bart ehrman's arguments and i'm like right. these, aren't, these aren't very good arguments bart right there's opinions yeah. most of the time yeah most of the time they're just like not even opinions so much as just like inserting history where it isn't right. there mm-hmm. right? like mm-hmm. a great example is like this idea that like the gospels were oral traditions for like six 45 to 70 years before the first gospel mm-hmm. was even written down so what's, mm-hmm. where's your evidence for that you don't right he doesn't actually have any he just asserts it right so yeah that's so very interesting, interesting. <laughs> i got the same thing <laughs> same response it's entirely possible <laughs> it's entirely possible <laughs> i love those clips that's awesome oh um, so, yeah, so you know it's entirely possible rogan that's great. So you you were saying how you started having like the you came across these questions that your your girlfriend was throwing at you that you're like oh yeah I never really thought about that. let me look into that um, along the way and over the years what have you what would you say off the top of your head if you can like think about it would be what was one of the hardest questions you received because I think what you do a lot on your channel that's really helpful is not only are you giving like intellectual answers to these problems but you're also helping all the Christians who are watching your channel be equipped to answer this question as well. So that was, yeah, what are, that was why I wanted to make the TikTok was not so much to try and convince the atheists who are, who are probably, you know, they're not necessarily their hearts are hardened, but you know, they're set in their ways. They think they're right. And they aren't necessarily open to like listening every now and again, you come across like the really open hearted people, right. but um for the most part, it's just, and it would be worth it even for those people I've decided, but um, the main reason was just to equip other Christians and people who are on the fence and just like stepping into this world so that they can see that Christians aren't being caught with their pants down, like, so to speak, when it comes to all of these objections that skeptics level against Christians, like, they're not as they're not as groundbreaking as they'd like you to think. Yeah, definitely. But what, you, your, your, your question was like, what was like one of the hardest things? Yeah, it was probably yeah. something that my, my girlfriend had raised with me. It was probably on our like second or third date, but we were like sitting like dark, like in our, like in our, in our room with the lights off. Like if we had just been talking really deeply for a while and like I brought up mm-hmm. that I was, that you know that I was Catholic and she like got this idea okay so God creates all these people knowing that like millions of them are going to go to hell and I just I didn't really have a response for that you know I didn't really think about it it that way you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you just think about it as God created all these people and some of us are going to go to heaven and some of the really awful people are going to go to hell. And it's like, you never really think like, it was the first time that I'd ever like gotten like something to a deep, deep question to like really sink your teeth into like, mm-hmm. wait, but God's God knows what's going to happen to these people. Doesn't he like what? So he's creating some of these people knowing that they're going to hell. And it was the it was a tough tough question. I don't know if it's the toughest question I've ever faced, but it was mm-hmm. like the opening of that door, right? You know. Yeah. So what's the answer to that for those listening and if they're wrestling with the um, same thing? The best the when I was learning under well, not like he was personally teaching me, but just like from listening to his podcast. When I was learning under Bishop Robert Barron, he had said. 
um, essentially that like, well, you need to understand something that like God is not in time with you guys. He's not, he's not in time with us. He's not watching time unfold along with us and predicting the end or preordaining the end, so to speak. Unless you're he an open is, theist. Yeah, yeah unless you're an open know. theist, which is open. Well, open theist is different, I thought. I thought open theist was, he's not even predicting the ending. It's just, he's just, he's, he's creating it. He's rolling it with the punches, yeah, as it yeah. happens. Yeah, he's like weaving you know? it in real time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, open theism is really interesting. Maybe we can talk more about that in a bit. But like the C.S. Lewis put it best, I think, that God, the creator of time is stands over and above time. Every single moment is equally present to him as the present is mm-hmm. to you. So um, Bishop Barron used the analogy of like the author and the story. Think about like Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien with Lord of the Rings. Like if he was impressive enough essentially he could just envision the whole story all at once right there's yeah. he's not an author can just kind of like have that inspiration and the whole story's there everything unfolded and one of the ways that god does that is he envisions he just knows all of the universe into existence and every moment is present to him every moment of it until the end of time is already present to him now yeah. mm-hmm. because god is eternal people there's something that atheists need to understand that like atheists and christians alike it would pay to understand is that eternal doesn't in the proper sense of that word does not mean time going on forever eternal means like timeless there like there's not time there's no time passing that gets to people like is. Stephen Hawking. Yeah, there just is, right? Which mm-hmm. explains the old burning bush, right? I am who I am. God is. God is not right. this. God is not that. God is. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's one of those things that makes me so excited when I think about, like, I, one of my favorite things to do, and I encourage all Christians to do this, is just sit and ponder what it means to be God. Like, oh, God's merciful. What does that mean? Does God have mercy? No, he doesn't have it because that means it can be acquired that like outside of him. He is the explanation. He's the source of whatever the thing that we call mercy is. Exactly. You know, and that like is super exciting. But with that, you know, you'd think when it comes to this question too, like, oh, God's creating all these people and they're going to go to hell and he knows that. How is he good if that's going to happen? I always think, you know, like, well, also, if you keep on that track of pondering what it means to be God, that means you created everything, which means you're the standard for everything. And the standard, I would assume, is necessarily good, right? Because we, we've talked in a yes. previous podcast about how an evil God probably wouldn't create because they'd be the totality of selfishness, um, you know, so they wouldn't want to share anything. So we, we've talked about how, like, an mm-hmm. evil God probably wouldn't create. So the fact that we're created lends itself to show that God's good. And so then if God is good and he's created this world where we do see bad stuff happening, I always like to go back to the idea that this has to be the best possible world that could exist, considering all the character of God and okay. the things that we so, see. Interestingly, I'm going to push back on like a lot of that, like Ooh, coming fun. from a different from a different space. Like, um, well, mm-hmm. I guess to, to kind of finish the answer to that tough question, it's like God made us free. We have free will. Yeah. And, you know, like a Calvinist can't answer that objection, <laughs> which is why I'm not a Calvinist. <laughs> they can, and, but it's just not very good. It's, it's like an answer. We can just say, I'm just lucky, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like they can't, like, they don't have a satisfactory answer to that objection, I right. should say. Right. Like some, right. like, I'm not going to pretend that Calvinists are all like intellectually dishonest or something. Right. Um, right. But um, to, yeah, to like fully answer the question, God made us free and God didn't like create us free. And then like, know ahead of time this guy's freedom is going to lead him to hell but i'll make him anyways Mm -hmm. like that's that's it's not quite how it works it's just it's all present to him at once it's unfolding so in a way god Mm -hmm. is watching you sin for the first time like in the present if that i'm trying to make make sure that i state this correctly you know like Mm -hmm. he's watching you do everything that you do 
in real time, but all of time is present to him. So that's how he yeah. knows he's watching it the all way everything is going to go. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's an aspect of predestination that is absolutely true. Right. Yeah. Because God is working in time. We're working on creation on all of it from start to end. But mm-hmm. yeah. he hasn't like the fact that he has granted us freedom means that he has not looked at our souls and preordained our outcome. Right. He knows mm-hmm. what the yeah. outcome is because he's watching it happen. Mm-hmm. Yes. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I always say, you know, predestined foreknowledge isn't God making it happen. Foreknowledge is just knowing what's happening. Right. Although there is an aspect in which God knows all things into existence. That's mm-hmm. the way that God's knowledge works. Otherwise, you're going to run into problems from like really intelligent atheists about like, can right. God's knowledge change? Does God get right, better right. or worse with more or less knowledge and stuff like that? Right. So God yeah. knows all things into existence and it's all one eternal moment. All of creation is one eternal happening. So mm-hmm. that gets us around the whole idea that God is changing over time as like facts about the world change. Mm-hmm. So that's something that's that's something worth keeping in mind. Oh my gosh. So where were we? I was gonna push against something that you said. Oh, uh, I said this is the evil best God hypothesis. World. The best possible world. I it could be no, it couldn't be because what would that even look like? God is the best possible reality. Nothing created can never be like the best possible. But the other aspect that I'd like to push back against is this idea that like God is obligated to make the best of possible, best of all possible worlds. Mm, God is obligated to not, God is not obligated to make the best of all possible worlds because God is not obligated to like create anything at He's all. He's not about, yeah. No. Well, that's, but, that's, uh, yeah, I, I think I, were you going to say more to that? Um, God is obligated to make a good world, a just world. He can't make an evil world that can't be can't possibly be justified because that right. would be contrary to his nature and wisdom. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that he can't like make a better world than this one. He probably could. In fact, I would say that he definitely could. This is one of like this is like the problem of the turning dial that like mm-hmm you can run into when you talk with atheists about the problem of evil. I just listened to a really long conversation, like a round table conversation on the problem of evil by Alex O'Connor, the cosmic skeptic on YouTube. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's great. Love his content. Yeah. And I just listened to him and Trent Horn, another person who I Trent's great really, as well. really, yeah. really love. I, <laughs> I, I listen to his podcast every day. He's one of my nice. favorite apologists out there he's Mm. incredibly intelligent and calm and articulate but you get you run into the problem of the turning dial with the problem of evil it's like god could alex o'connor constantly brings up the objection of like god could just you could think you could envision a better possible world right now somebody is slipping off of a cliff to their death instead Mm. of that like god makes that rock disappear for a second boom now you have a better possible world and you could think about like well no because the interconnection of that person dying and then all the things happening later like you could like theodicy your way out of that but i think the more fundamental critique of god is obligated to make a best possible world is just no he's not he's not obligated to do so i guess not obligated to make anything I want to get a shirt that just says, I can theodicy my way out of this. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be a great shirt. <laughs> we can make it. We can make it and sell it. Um, but to push back, awesome. I think I would ask, like, I guess I'd say, like, I feel like then you need to explain why God isn't obligated to make the best possible world. And I would say best possible, not meaning, like, the best. Like, obviously, he's the best. Nothing can top him. But the best with also all the attributes that he wants so he wants us to have free will well to have a world and free will you have to have like in order to have the best possible world of free will evils yeah we have to have possible evils right and so i I guess i would push back and say like what why what would a better world look like and that with all the things god wants it to have and why would god not make that 
Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know, because I'm not God. I don't have like the, um, <laughs> the omniscient knowledge of everything that is entailed by the world that we live in. I do think that this is an incredible and beautiful world. And like, in a way, it will be the best of all possible worlds because of heaven, right? Yeah. When it comes to materiality. And so I guess I just, you can always envision God changing the terms on which the world exists and that being quote unquote better or worse mm -hmm. is part of like what I would say could change the game. Like there's always the question of mm -hmm. why not heaven now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, definitely. It's, that's a it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a really that's probably one of the toughest objections that i think about uh as a christian why not heaven now and i think it has to be going some to process make, of yeah. soul building yeah i opinion. see but there doesn't have to be because angels didn't my angels that. aren't humans though yeah that's true like, we are clearly different mm -hmm. and like, yeah you could say that angels for, for different reasons weren't made in the so, like, so if god wanted to make humans okay that's that's an interesting way to think about it um yeah that's My one answer of the answers that. yeah that's okay. one of the answers that i float and i'm thinking about making a video on it soon just like the mm. idea of like is it even if your soul ended up the same way in the end is mm -hmm. it better to be born perfect or to like become good and defeat evil like that's a that's a that's an intuition that's worth thinking about. Yeah, I don't think they're the same though. Like they can't be the same because one has a journey that you learn so much on, and the other one just has a state of being where you never experienced like the the knowledge of the good and evil that like is said to be known through eating the fruit, right? Mm -hmm. And so one one has this process of sanctification and becoming holy like God, where he like beckons us to become holy through himself. Um, and the other one you just are in the garden and it's very good. Right. It doesn't even like the Bible doesn't even say it's perfect. It just says that it, it is very good. good. It's very good. And so there's this process of the fall and sanctification that isn't like present in the beginning. And so mm -hmm. there is the thing that's gained through this experience, in my opinion, is the process of becoming like God, becoming holy, becoming sanctified. And yeah, and I think that's I, probably the best answer. Yeah. It's the only one I can think of that's like good enough. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. But like, yeah. you know, some people would just like, that one is a tough one to answer because it comes down to competing intuitions. Like yeah. for instance, Alex O'Connor would just stamp his foot down and say, no, I'd rather just be born perfect. And right. like people like, well, like Christians, for instance, would say, no, like it's better to like become good and defeat evil. Like it's just, mm -hmm. there's, I don't know. I kind of feel like I'd be kind of just an intuition there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's easier. You know, so it's like, Oh, there I am. Cool. I get to, I get to chill you know yeah but, it's uh <laughs> but there, there's, a, there's a joy in, in there's definitely a joy in sanctification you know i'm not gonna mm -hmm. minimize that i love mm -hmm. c.s lewis's line um i just got done reading the problem of pain again today well yeah, uh, read read is a strong word i listen to audiobooks i don't read anything me too oh yeah me too, <laughs> me too. are you dyslexic dyslexic no i'm not, i am not dyslexic oh, but i, I just <laughs> I was going to time. Oh, well, nice. then audiobooks are fantastic. Yeah, they're so good. But I just um, got done. I just wrapped up with the problem of pain again today. C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis's line about like the artist. Um, oh, know, yeah. Reshaping and breaking down the pottery and reshaping it again until it's perfect. And if the mm -hmm. we imagine if the pottery were conscious, it would probably cry out and be like, why are you doing this to me? And the, con and the pot would just wish that it was a simple little thumbnail sketch that was just mm. quick and easy to put together and mm -hmm. the the kind of like laconic killer line from c.s lewis is just well to ask for that is to ask for less love not more love right mm. that's deep right good god has god has paid us the intolerable compliment of loving us yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's awesome all right moving on with the conversation a little bit back to atheism. I know we could talk about this for a long time. Best <laughs> possible world. It's yeah. awesome. I'd love to talk about it. Um, but moving back to atheism a little bit, what's it like, like experiencing the, the TikTok atheist like realm? Because for myself, I'm a little older and I've existed a lot on like the YouTube slash like Twitter atheist realms and like been on those discussion boards for a long time. Um, but like, is it, 
is it very different on TikTok versus like the other platforms that atheism has sort of grown up on, if that makes sense? I'd say so, yeah. Like I I only have like kind of like tertiary experience with like mm-hmm. Reddit atheists, you know, like right. the, uh, you see the memes, but then you see like the, <laughs> the thinker, you see the thinkers that like spawned that kind of thinking, like Christopher yeah. Hitchens and Richard, Do- Richard Dawkins, yeah. and Sam Harris and Daniel right. Dennett and like those like you know pretty uh, sophomoric philosophy right i'm tempted to call it sophistry you know some right. of it's not even real philosophy it's yeah a lot of it isn't real arrogance yeah. like but <laughs> on tiktok it's interesting because they're almost they're almost not even playing a philosophy game at all a lot of yeah. the people like coming from who are more antagonistic coming mm-hmm. from the deconstruction world there's a lot of like conspiracy theories and like, Mm -hmm. that was the first thing I, the first video I ever pulled up when I downloaded TikTok and I searched up the hashtag Mm exvangelical was a video of someone explaining how Jesus was just an allegory for the sun, like the literal sun, Jesus. We responded to that video actually. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I was like, this has 8 million views. Yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> People are all like, they're not going to like these facts in the comments. And I'm like, yeah. oh, oh no. Yeah. It's yeah. like, what you have to do a stepped quick into YouTube search. a quick YouTube search to find out historically, no one affirms that. Yeah. Like, but it, or just a Google search. Like, did yeah. Jesus actually yeah. exist? The answer is yeah. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's like, there's like Richard Carey. And yeah. that's like it, like as far as like yeah. accredited historians who would say no. And yeah. Richard mm-hmm. Carrier is kind of like tinfoil hattery. Mm-hmm. So it's- So you think the level of um, maybe not authenticity, but the level that like atheists have performed on has gone down with TikTok rather than like gone up? Mm, maybe I would say that like there are still like deeply thoughtful people that I ended up finding like for instance yeah, Abraham for sure. Piper he's right. he's a tough cookie to crack because he's yeah. a nihilist nihilists right. are famously hard to philosophize sure. against yeah yeah because <laughs> they're like accepting such a crazy fate but it is the natural end of their worldview yeah it is it and that's why I enjoy Abraham Piper he's consistent yeah. He, mm-hmm. he oh. just accepts the implications of atheism and accepts nihilism, which right. most people aren't willing to bite that bullet, which is good in a way because that gives you, you can find that bullet they're not willing to bite and say, look, see, this is, an, this is a clue that there's something that's not right with your worldview. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's still that kind of hope. Now that, that's a dangerous game because you can, for instance, like human exceptionalism, like that, mm-hmm. the concept that humans have intrinsic moral worth rather than right. just kind of like a a, a kind Subjective of practical moral mo- a, pr- a practical yeah. moral worth is probably mm-hmm. the way that like an atheist would put it it's like right. you can you can put that up against an atheist and i've done this like press them on that and i've gotten two different results you know i've pressed someone and said hey how can you justify like human flourishing as something that is good in and of itself and one of them said, huh, I guess you have a point. Maybe there's more to theism than I thought. Mm-hmm. And they don't go with just evolution? With, huh? It's, they don't go with, well, uh, with evolution as in, like, you know, evolutionarily we need, if that's a word, like we need to have human flourishing so we can evolve and become better. Because I feel like that'd be a pretty easy. But why should we, but why should we become better? Why should well, we go would on? Would they not say that it's just the natural course of evolution? Isn't that a natural? Isn't that a naturalistic fallacy? Just because something's natural, that doesn't mean, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just thinking about what they would say. Yeah, the play out, and that was kind of the way I went. Was they, they, they did trot that out, right? And Mm -hmm. I kind of brought up, hey, that's uh, okay, that's great, but just because something's natural, that doesn't mean that it's good in and of itself. What makes us as humans good in and of ourselves? Because like, because like naturally, animals like they rape each other you know so you're saying like why should humans why should humans flourish over the elephant species you know why yeah, is, or is that kind of like what makes you different than yeah, elephant? Or, like, or at all you know 
like yeah. you could argue you could argue that oh because human flourishing increases with pleasure but then you're going to run up against somebody like what's his name david benatar the anti-natalist hmm. and he i don't know what that word means. Point. what is it What's an anti-natalist? an anti-natalist is somebody who thinks that the human race shouldn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. He doesn't oh. want to like kill people because he he's coming from a utilitarian perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Pleasure, good, pain, bad. Those are the two yeah, right. intrinsically good and evil things. And uh, human beings are probably going to experience more pain than pleasure in their life. The pleasure is not really going to outweigh it because pleasure is just not bad and pain is bad. It's better never mm-hmm. to have brought someone into existence. So he's an anti-natal, natal, like as in like the baby, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So he's yeah. against people having babies. He's against people reproducing. Hmm. And that's a growing movement on TikTok as well, which I was uh, mortified by. But it's interesting. Well, it's also a trend like in America, America, like Western countries that are producing less and less and less. It, yeah, that's that yeah, that that's also true. Um, but the that bullet of like humans having intrinsic moral worth you can either refuse to bite it and say okay maybe there's something to this whole we have worth because we have something like an immortal soul that is Mm -hmm. that is made in the image of something which is utterly good in and of itself or the danger in making that objection is that and i have ran into atheists who have done this just bite the bullet and say yeah you're right we don't right. have intrinsic worth. I'm just going to be a, a pragmatist or a utilitarian in the kind of caricatured sense of that, you know, like just right. increase, increase pleasure, decrease pain. Mm-hmm. Doesn't really matter how you do it. Mm-hmm. Right. An optimistic nihilist. Uh, yeah, that an optimistic, yeah. Like maybe an optimistic nihilist, but like, yeah, I guess that's one way to think about it. Or like an antinatalist or like somebody who's like a vegan or a Jainist mm-hmm. who says, so that, and there's nothing wrong, nothing like nothing, nothing wrong in and of itself with being vegan. But like, you know, yeah. like that is an interesting implication that comes out of like atheism when you press people to be consistent. Right. Is mm-hmm. that they realize that humans aren't exceptional in any way. And if decreasing suffering is important for humans, well, then it's also important for you know other creatures every living creature every yeah. living thing yeah but that's another thing you can yeah. press them on is why is it important right and that's that's yeah. why it it can devolve into not so cheerful nihilism the only consistent <laughs> the only consistent atheist philosopher would be like nietzsche which is right. that's a horrifying uh, path to go down yeah mm-hmm. have you um ever heard of uh capturing christianity Cameron Bertuzzi, love his yeah. content. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna I was gonna ask if you have seen his most well, not his most recent, but one of his most recent videos about how um, Christianity makes life and basically theism, but Christianity makes life more fulfilling as compared to uh, an atheist point of view. As it compared to like naturalism, the idea that the natural world is all there is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen that video yet? No, but I've heard him make arguments like that a lot like i i kind of watch his content selectively based on who he's interviewing and stuff like that yeah. you know just what my interests are i right but i, I sure. love his content he's a super honest humble guy yeah. who just he 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 doesn't do a lot of the talking a lot of the times he just kind of he he just calls on these people who he views as knowing more about him on a particular topic he lets like and just ask some questions yeah, really like his. I like I like his content a lot. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was a, a really interesting video. It made a lot of good points about how, because I, I whenever I talk to atheists or I run, I talk I like I always have this problem. Like I don't understand your point for living. Like, what is your purpose? You know, like even Buddhists have a better answer. Yeah, and like. I, th- the honest atheists that I've talked about essentially just say, just stamp your feet down and say, because it's voluntarism, if you will, like you just assert your will over life and say, this is Hmm. my purpose because I like, because I, this is what I want. And like, you know, that's great. If you're going to abide by like, you know, like traditional morality anyways, 
But Mm -hmm. for people who are going to say my purpose in life is to reduce the number of people on the planet at all costs. And that includes, that might include killing some people. Like uh, what do you do when you butt heads with someone like that? And that was kind of the idea that I pressed against people who say, oh, why be morally good or pursue moral goods, even though human beings aren't exceptional or there's no such thing as moral goodness? Well, do you want to live in a stable society? Right. And mm-hmm. that, that trumped me for about a week. And I thought about it and I came up with, okay, but someone with a lot of power could just like make a tyranny. And this is like something that C.S. Lewis thought about in The Abolition of Man. Someone powerful enough could just make a stable society really unethically. You can think about mm-hmm. how, you can think about- not a lot. You can think about Nazi Germany and how stable it was, how mm-hmm. stable and like agreeable, like internal Aryan Germany was mm-hmm. because yeah. somebody with a lot of power didn't really care what had to happen in order to achieve that society. And that's kind right. of something that you right. have to up against if you're not going to make an appeal to something like objective morality, something is good mm-hmm. because it is intrinsically good and that intrinsic goodness is it flows from god's goodness for sure yeah, yeah. i have had one conversation with a guy a years ago one one time and all the time i talk to people about like faith and philosophy that had that answer because I, I pulled that too i was like do you think hitler did a good job like like you think he was a good guy and he's like well if hitler's purpose was to kill everyone that he did yeah he did a good job and I was like, wow, all right. Yeah, it's hard to even, care. I love when you, have you ever seen that meme of like how to argue, how to beat a nihilist in a debate? It's like uh, somebody Googles no. how to beat a nihilist in a debate. And the, the automated Google answer that came up was kill them. The best way <laughs> to beat a nihilist in a debate is to kill them. <laughs> Oh my god. That's awesome. They do not believe life has intrinsic value and you do not have any objective standards upon which to base common ground conversations. So the best way mm-hmm. to defeat a nihilist in a conversation is to kill them. So far. Yeah, disclaimer we're not it's endorsing murder. Yeah. <laughs> it's a meme. Yeah. It's a meme. <laughs> yeah. So getting back to atheism sort of at its roots, as obviously we talked about a little bit earlier, it's been growing exponentially over the last few years, maybe like the last uh, 20 years or so, sort of starting with Nietzsche a little bit like way back, but like Mm -hmm. gaining a lot of popularity now, right? With its its roots in Nietzsche. Um, Why do you think so many people now, like in the last 10, 20 years are becoming atheists and it's becoming so much more popular to either be like sort of an agnostic atheist or just atheists like completely? Well, and that's a huge question too. I would say that that that's a local problem. That's an Amer- that's a Western world problem. Right. So because lots of people are not becoming atheists in South America and Africa, for instance, mm. they're all becoming Christian in droves. So there there it's got to be something that has to do with the culture. Mm. I would say that westernized society. Yeah, and I I would say, like you said, it comes, it seems like it it has its roots to Nietzsche, but like in the last 10, 15 years, social media, the internet, Mm -hmm. and that's not a, that's not to poo poo the internet at all. It is a gift from God. Honestly, you have a supercomputer in your pocket and with in 10 seconds, you can have, you can have knowledgeable access to anything you want. Anything right. that the human race has ever accumulated as knowledge, you can, you can, it can be at your fingertips in 10 seconds. It's incredible. Yeah. But what that means is, and this is particularly a problem in the American church, is that if people are being told, check your brain at the door, maybe not literally, but, you know, being, if someone comes up with a problem, like saying, well, how do you even know God exists at all? Or, well, Hey, I'm really struggling with my, my sexuality and I'm not sure what to think about. And they're just told, 
you need to have faith. How, you sure, you sure, you sure you love Jesus? If you're really having a question like that, you really mm-hmm. have faith in Jesus. If you're going to have a question like that, that is destroying Christianity from the inside out. Yeah. That, that mindset is incredibly harmful mm-hmm. because it, it lead it because for a lot of people it's like okay yeah and then they think about it and they say oh i guess i i need to have faith in jesus i just i i shouldn't be thinking about these things stupid why was i thinking about that having these evil doubts pop into my head you know and maybe that works for a time but now we have the internet you can you can go on the internet and you can find people who will take the those questions that you have give you the exact wrong answer right and they'll take the christian answer that they heard and rip it to shreds right and another aspect of it um today i just was listening to a podcast talking about a pew forum survey that was done and why people are leaving uh the catholic church in specific in droves Number one reason was just, I don't believe the doctrines. They don't Mm -hmm. make intellectual sense. And that comes from, you know, it comes from just Christians not being able to have an answer, I think, to the thoughtful, the frankly thoughtful critiques that atheists pose, but we've had these answers for 2000 years. Right. Like, not like we have all the answers, like right at the beginning, but like we've over the 2000 year span of Christianity, we've seen pretty much all of it. Mm-hmm. And the, there is a Christian tradition that has thoughtfully come up with answers to these sorts of things. The other right. aspect of it is we, for better or for worse, are a very sexual society. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I listened to your guys' the first podcast I listened to you from you guys was like one that you guys did like two or three weeks ago. And you spent like half an hour just talking about masturbation. I was like, okay, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> I this sounds like my type of podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and, and but I think that I think that can be a big aspect of it is people are saying, Hey, I'm struggling with my sexuality. And mm-hmm. you know, on the internet, that kind of that this kind of sexual mindset is encouraged and like i think it's a good thing honestly that america is very open and frank and honest about sex and everything having to do with it but like christians are not at least in the american church and that's 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 causing problems because when people come up against i've kind of made it into like an informal argument before It's like these these particular sexual ideologies are true. Christianity says that these sexual ideologies are false and or evil. Therefore, Christianity is not true. Yeah. And I think that's something that you have to think about. And like, you have to, you have to contend with it. And you can't just, you can't just like, there's definitely a problem of people have this perception of Christians that ends up being like, you know, the Westboro Baptists, you know, right. God hates mm-hmm. gays. No, God hates your stupid sign. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's tough. Cause I think the thing I haven't really talked too much about sexuality on my TikTok because it's raw for a lot of people my age. Yeah. And maybe they're just tired of hearing about it in the Christian world. And the other thing is like, hey, uh, you know, a, a, a Christian who struggles with those sorts of issues maybe isn't the person who should be moralizing on them. So like, I'm, I, I, I will leave it to others, but I guess the one thing mm-hmm. I would say is that you just, we have to be able to think about this stuff and be willing to have the conversations, whether it's yeah. about atheism or sexual things. It seems like the two big things are things having to do with, uh, LGBTQ identities and the politics surrounding that, or like people just think that Christianity doesn't make sense because yeah. they haven't been given an intellectually enriching uh, mm. form of it. So you think that the 
push of so many people going to atheism is not necessarily an attractiveness of atheism, but the repulsiveness of the church necessarily and the hindrance of conversations about sexuality and sort of a, an anti-intellectualism in the church as well? Absolutely, because what it seems like is that people my age, they aren't so much atheists as they are skeptics. Most people my yeah. age think that atheists are insufferable. What they end up being is some kind of spiritualist, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a book, I forget who it's by, um, but it's called Strange Rights. Hmm. And it kind of documents this idea not this idea, the phenomena that's currently rising up from people our generation and younger, which is that, yeah, all of these people are marking none on surveys when they say, like, what part of what formal religion are you a part of? But they're not atheists. They're just becoming spiritual in an informal way. Like you think about like manifest, manifesting or shifting. If you if you've ever seen that content on TikTok, it it seems right. some of it's really like out of this world but yeah. like and like it doesn't make sense at all but mm -hmm. these aren't naturalists so to speak you know these right. aren't people who think that all there is is the material world they're just people who find christianity or organized religion maybe would be a better uh diagnosis they find that mm -hmm. repulsive right right mm -hmm. i almost Very find when people say that they're spiritual i, I sometimes i have almost a harder time talking to them about the faith or evangelizing with them because then I'd be like atheist because um, there it's always like so uh, subjective to the person, right? Well, I'm spiritual. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Uh, I believe that there's good spirits and bad spirits. And do you think those good spirits and bad spirits have a source? Like, where do you think those come from? Or I think spirits are neutral and yeah. they, they can help or they cannot, or there's just energy in the world that I can harness it that we can't see. And, and, there's, they can go so many different ways, and everyone you talk to is different. So with yeah, that, like, yeah. oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, no, go ahead and ask the question. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, have you had much conversation with those people? And also, like, what should the Christian posture be in having discussion with those people, but also with like atheists and any, anyone that we're trying to share with? Find common ground. Agree whenever mm -hmm. possible. Like, obviously, don't agree to things that are antithetical to the faith or are harmful <laughs> or anything like that. Like, but yeah. agree whenever agree whenever you can. I don't think the material world is all that there is. I agree. You know, mm -hmm. like that. that's. And then the other thing is, when whenever you're evangelizing, whatever you're doing, make friendships. You're not yeah. here to ostracize people. Jesus will do the ostracizing by his very person if it comes down to it. Like he said, he is the sword or he comes as a sword or with a sword. I'm sorry. Right. I am so terrible at quoting. Scripture. No, yeah, <laughs> sure. That's pretty accurate. But, comes with a sword. Yeah. But um, like our job is you, if you want to be an effective evangelist, be friends with people that you disagree with. Be friends with people who are not Christians and come from a place of actually caring about them. And not just coming from a place of your, your lifestyle is disordered. Or you're a sinner or, you know, mm -hmm. Hey, you're gay. Like that doesn't, that's not going to change anybody's mind. Right. It's not productive. No. Do you care about these people or do you just care about pointing out that, you know, like there are, there is such a thing as sexual disorder. Mm -hmm. Right. Love the, if like try makes... to win the person. Don't win the argument. That, that was like, well, when I learned that it was kind of like, yeah, I guess the person is more important than the argument at hand. And then advice when it comes to like LGBTQ stuff. Mm. Like don't, being gay is not a sin. Like that needs to be like made clear. Like mm. beings, you can't control who you're attracted to. Right. Sins are willful actions, right? You can't mm -hmm. like the... And don't even frame it in the, the discussion of like this lifestyle of yours is sinful. Cause like, would you say that to somebody about anything else? Mm -hmm. Like, would you say, would you say that to somebody about anything else? Like that when, it, when push comes to shove, Christians are called to chastity. Like straight people aren't exempt from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unmarried, yeah. Yeah. It, well, marriage, in marriage you're called to chastity too you're like chastity doesn't mean no sex chastity okay. just I means I don't understand that the, 
chat the way that the catholic tradition for instance defines chastity is just the proper ordering of sexuality okay to its proper ends so within marriage you have to be chaste too you can't just like view your wife as an object that makes you feel good that mm-hmm. would be like if if people are like if people are facing hellfire for sins against chastity it's gonna be a lot more straight people than gay people mm-hmm. if for no mm-hmm. other reason then there's just, there's just more straight people but right like especially like christians because christians know better or they should know better mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well also like to your, to your point about how like you know the being gay is not a sin like you can't control who you're attracted to there's children who are born with addictions due to how their parents acted when they were like or the mother acted when they were pregnant you know a baby might be born with a heroin addiction but you're not mm-hmm. going to ever tell that baby like oh you're a sinner because you're an addict it's like well i i didn't do anything i never did heroin or i never like put myself in this position i was just born in this position exactly it's, would you say it's pretty it, similar it's it's almost exactly similar because like the idea that like people that people just like choose to be gay like it doesn't even like on the surface it doesn't make sense you know Mm -hmm. like i I will say like one of my favorite points with that i don't know if i said this last week or recently but like my favorite counterpoint to that because a lot of people say like oh like some people say like or they used to say that i think society's matured since then but they used to say oh you're gay like are you sure have you ever like been with a woman and i heard a gay person reply like oh how do you know you're not gay have you ever been with the same sex like you know, oh, yeah, you know. Like, and yeah. it's like, oh, that's like one of my favorite responses. Yeah, it's the well, and that's the thing is like the you can hardly blame Christians for their behavior surrounding it because they aren't talking about sex at all. Mm-hmm. That's like a problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like God made it and it's good and it needs to be talked about. <laughs> like it isn't like some regrettable accident that like we reproduce and like find union with our spouses by having sex. Right. (laughs) It's important. It's a, it's a good part of life. And you think about the the other thing is like, if there's any kind of non-Christian who like, if there's any kind of like sin that is like, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? that you need to be a lot easier on than other sins, it would be sexual sins. Think about like the seven deadly sins, Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. pride, envy, uh, wrath, sloth, gluttony, Mm -hmm. what am I missing? Greed and lust, right? It not, I think I did that out of order. So it goes lust from, from, lowest in severity to greatest in severity it would go lust like according to you know christian tradition it would go Mm -hmm. lust from least severity then to gluttony then to wrath then to greed then to sloth then to envy then to uh pride if i'm not mistaken Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. i don't know it was in that order lowest huh right lust and the reason Yeah. And the reason why it's not just arbitrary, like, oh, everybody struggles with lust. Therefore, it's like the least bad. Like that doesn't make sense. But Mm -hmm. the reason why is that if you think about each of those sins as you go up on the scale, hmm, someone is calling me. I just have to have to let that go. Um, (laughs) Sorry. Um, (laughs) If you think about the sins as they go up on the scale from lower severity to greater severity they become more they become less and less bodily and more and more spiritual right they harm your core jesus said like the evil that comes from within is the kind of evil that you should fear most right Mm -hmm. so you think about like lust that's almost entirely your body dude like Mm -hmm. people who people who struggle with and what is lust is it sex outside of marriage not exactly is it what it is, is it's viewing another person as an object for your pleasure. Hmm. For your, se- mm-hmm. it's view it, 
it's using your sexuality to take instead of to give in yeah. love. Now yeah. you can, you have to qualify that and say, qualify love and say from a Christian perspective, the loving context for sexual like intercourse, for instance, would just be marriage. Yeah. That's, that's the only context. So like straight people are going to be, if you're not married straight or gay, like you're held to that standard. Mm-hmm. Do you remember which saint um, first ordered them in that order? Cause I know I've heard Dante. Um, he was like the one I remember saying that um, like he ordered um, lust being like the least. St. Gregory, St. Gregory ordered them that way. And okay, top, yeah. other theologians have like backed that up. Like Thomas Aquinas, Dante, right, yeah. uh, C.S. Lewis, I think is another example of that. Like there's, a, yeah, it, uh, it's, it's pretty firmly in the Christian tradition. Right. Hmm. Honestly, I'm surprised that gluttony is, not the first one i feel like that'd be the i feel like that's the easiest maybe because actually maybe because i'm living in america where there's an abundance of food everywhere i go that it's seems easier like... to con it's easier to control your impulse to eat than it is to control a sexual impulse yeah that's true that's true well that's what, that's, I think what do that's, you think that i think is? that's part of it i would say that's why i guess that's why it's more bad is because you have less self-control you know if oh, you're right. following the yeah, it's well and that will the 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 other the thing that makes them worse and worse and worse is they are more willful as you get up on the scale pride is nothing but will that has nothing to do with your body angels have pride and that's why we call them demons Mm. Mm -hmm. but you know the lower down you go the more it attacks things that will fall away and Mm -hmm. will fall away with your death and then there will just be your naked soul for God to judge and you're going to find out which things were kind of like you know unfortunate facts about your body and which things were your actual free choice for instance mm-hmm. that it's not a free license to just give in to lust whenever you want because right. if you're right and this is this goes for any addiction if you're complacent in your addiction or you just you have no desire to get out of it at all then you are responsible for it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but if you if you're if you're if you're making an effort you know that 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 makes a difference right so that's that's kind of the the aspect of like the seven deadly sins so like if ever there was a a kind of sin that american christians need to be more patient and thoughtful with and like cut people some dang slack with it would be sexual sins yeah, and I know you guys did an episode talking about like how untalked about gluttony is. It is a lower <laughs> sin, but like it, the other thing is like don't forget like hey like they're the seven deadly sins. They're not just like hey this is barely a sin at all. It's practically okay. Yeah, like even on the yeah. lower end, like still harmful. Even if for even if for whatever reason you're not you can't be held morally responsible for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it's good yeah so as we're sort of coming a little bit to the end here mm-hmm. encapsulating everything um we talked about atheism um we talked about the christian church and some of our downfalls where do we think we're going like we've got so many awesome conversations happening on tiktok between christians and atheists and people deconstructing some people reconstructing coming back to the faith um we talked about how the church is growing in africa and asia and how some people are leaving the evangelical or even the Catholic faith, um, like you said. Where do we think the future of the church is going um, when it comes to these fears of atheism, TikTok, and stuff like that? Where's where's the direction that we're headed in? Uh, maybe like what things can we do to sort of um, make that a better future? If that makes sense. Future That's of. The future of the Christian church, I guess, is that the most plentiful numbers, and I mean, Jesus predicted it 2,000 years ago, blessed are the poor, like the most plentiful mm-hmm. numbers are going to be in places like Africa and South America, you know, America, the church is going to be small, but I do think the church is going to be much stronger. Mm-hmm. We can see it as a kind of working of the Holy Spirit that like people are leaving in droves because these p and that atheists are rising in numbers and becoming more thoughtful and critical because it's Mm. it's rooting out bad christians yeah it's rooting out people it's it and it's 
pointing the finger at Christianity where Christianity has been inadequate and it's forcing us to kind of uh, sharpen our, sharpen our swords as it will, you know, not to go too far with like a battle metaphor, but you know, um, I've encouraged a lot of violence this episode. So, (laughs) 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 but I think that like the American church in the future is going to be a lot sharper when you find when you I think you guys talked about this a bit when you'd like trace people deconstructing if they do come back to Christianity generally they come back to a like a pretty intellectually rich Christian tradition people who deconstruct from like evangelical and fundamentalist places they'll either come to like state a reformed tradition of some kind right or an orthodox or a catholic tradition catholic. where like you have like a very rich well thought out theology and understanding and of history. the Christian faith yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. so and you know you're people like william lane craig saved the day mm-hmm. in the early 2000s and in the youtube mm-hmm. era People like right. inspiring philosophy, Michael Jones, uh, right. you know, these people were, were saving yeah. the day when Christians were just dropping the ball <laughs> right. against the atheist movement. And now it seems like, you know, you're finding more everyday Christians. I'm an, I'm an everyday Christian. Mm-hmm. You're finding more everyday Christians who are being taught the richness of the Christian tradition, the, the, in, the intellectual aspect of it, the philosophy mm-hmm. And I think that's going to strengthen the Western church. It's probably also going to shrink the Western church because people are still leaving. And I don't think atheism is going to increase in numbers. I think people are starting to realize that like nihilism is bust. People, especially in the age of the internet, are like beginning to get very sick and tired of their life having no transcendent purpose. And that's Mm -hmm. where Christians need to step up and be the evangelists who say here's the transcendence mm-hmm. there's limits that. to there's there's limits to being purely intellectually an evangelist that's kind mm-hmm. of what i'm called to because it's what i'm good at and well I, I it's good at i i know stuff about it <laughs> mm-hmm. i'm good know? at it too you know proof is in the Thanks. pudding here I appreciate it. Um, it, People follow me. So that's, that's, that's always a good sign. (laughs) People hear what I have to say and they don't leave all negative comments. Um, Mm -hmm. There's limits to an intellectual evangelization though. It's helpful for providing a, for, for providing solid answers when questions arrive, but thinking about Christianity is not the substance of Christianity. This mm. is a lesson that I have to talk, that I have to teach myself constantly. Mm. A more effective mode of evangelization would probably be showing the beauty of Christianity, showing the purpose mm. within Christianity. This is where evangelicals flourish. This is yeah. where Christians are gaining in numbers. And you see that this is where Catholicism has like where i enjoy the advantage of catholicism we have very beautiful churches i don't have to say a word to some of my friends i just say come to mass with me and they go into this beautiful church with just these massive domes mosaics of like Mm -hmm. gold dusted tiles in the shape of the face of christ you know yeah and you don't have to say a word it just it grabs you Mm-hmm. evangelize with beauty tell people to listen to beautiful music get your friends to go outside more to like tut, like the best advice that the best way you could evangelize would probably just be to tell like skeptics to touch grass <laughs> <laughs> like if i wanted to make a little meme quip <laughs> yeah touch grass like yeah enter the real world because that will cast away it it's the philosopher charles taylor talks about the buffered self that's the western problem that's what we have to deal with is us we're dealing with people who are buffered from the transcendental aspects of reality 
mm-hmm. beauty, objective, objective beauty, objective truth, and objective goodness. Everything, mm-hmm. those three things have become subjectivized in Western culture. That may be a big part of why people are falling away from Christianity, but then also not coming back. Because people mm-hmm. fall away for intellectual reasons and then they discover the intellectual tradition, right? right? But what we're finding is that people are falling away for intellectual reasons and then they stay out because they just gave, they give up on the operation of objective truth, objective goodness, objective beauty. And right. so that's where you get all of the, the spiritualist movements manifesting, astrology, uh, witch talk, you know? <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. I really like what you're you're saying with all that because I, I remember I was in a country in the Middle East like two a year and a half ago, and um, we met these like New Agers, and this girl like had like genuinely seemed way more excited about life and at peace in the world than like I did in the moment and like in my emotional internal state, and I got mad about it because I was like, I know I have a relationship with the Creator of the universe, and yet this girl seems to have more peace than I do. And I was like, I think I'm going to be on a journey to discover like, like deep, genuine peace from Jesus. Cause I think if we could seriously as Christians, like look and like experience that peace that God brings, right. That transcends all understanding as I think Ephesians or Philippians says Philippians, maybe um, definitely not Ephesians Philippians um, says uh, it's like it's that. Thank you. The peace yeah. of Christ that, that surpasses all understanding. Yeah. Yeah. That will, if we can, if we live that out, in a, in, especially in this outrage culture that we're surrounded by, we would be, we would stand out like a sore thumb in the fact that like, hey, like, yeah, I'm, I'm on, I'm not worried. I'm not anxious. I am uh, at peace. You know, I don't have everything, everything together. I'm not being shallow about it, but I just like have a, this deep trust in my creator. Like, I think but, that but, would, yeah, would but, like, be not apathetic. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not apathetic, like yeah. very rich, rich peace. Um, I think that would, would have like make waves in in showing the evidence of of how powerful christianity can be i'm gonna like i guess with some final advice for christians in for american evangelization if you are good at the intellectual aspect of the faith study it read c.s lewis's mere christianity read you know read the good stuff you know Mm -hmm. Get in, fa- watch the old debates between William Lane Craig and like Sam Harris. Watch those guys. That watch the new debates between Alex O'Connor and Trent Horn, between Trent mm-hmm. Horn and Ben Watkins. Ben Watkins, oh my gosh, I love that guy. Mm-hmm. What a what a thoughtful atheist. But if <laughs> you have that intellectual, what a you had. What did I say? Did I say a faithful atheist? Thoughtful. <laughs> thoughtful. thoughtful. Okay, thank yeah. goodness. Thoughtful. I'm. I'm getting scrambled here at the end. I mean, they could, have, they could be faithful in the fact that consistent. Yeah, he's a he's a deeply thoughtful and kind atheist. I I really love Ben Watkins' content. So, like, you know, engage the best of the best, and in, indulge in the best of the best when it comes to studying Christianity and the Christian tradition. Um, and then I would say, have that ready for anyone who has questions. If you want to be the sort of person that is like kind of like, you know, uh, standing at the gates, keeping the dogs at bay that come to attack Christianity, try to catch us, um, you know, not thinking about these things, just be ready. But if you want to convert hearts, there's the three transcendentals, you know, I'm kind of focused on truth. That's kind of like the transcendental that I have an emphasis on. There's goodness, right? What is morally good? And there's the beautiful. If you tell American skeptics, ex-Christians, I'll tell you what's true. And they're coming from a world now of subjectivism, relativism. You can't tell what's true. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you what's good. People hate that. That's that. That's like all of outrage culture, mm-hmm. you know. But the beautiful isn't isn't like that. It's just look at this. Just look. There's a transcendental that can break in to the that kind of that self that's buffered against God. Mm-hmm. That can't mm-hmm. that can't perceive the transcendentals. That just that doesn't view that doesn't have an awareness or a kind of 
unity or intimacy with the transcendentals. Lead with beauty, and then you, but you need to be prepared with your your truth and your moral goodness. And then keep up a prayer life. Like this is a danger that I constantly have to avoid is to not turn it into like an intellectual like game. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking about like Christianity in, in the final analysis is not a philosophy of life. It's Mm -hmm. something that actually happened in history Mm. and it's our destiny at the end of our life. Mm. Very well said. Very well said. It's about the the only well said thing. <laughs> Not true at all. Not true. <laughs> yeah, this was this was a great podcast. Yeah. It was really enlightening. I think uh, very helpful and also very fun. You know, I love mm. the, the pushback and, and the different like uh, bat- banter back and forth. Uh, we we could have um we we've been talking about if you if you like debate and that's something you're into. We've been talking about like we should get some of our guests to come back and we'll, we'll host a little little debate. Um, yeah. be a little. A little bit of fun. I'd I'd love to debate uh pro life. That's the kind of thing that I think really? like I know enough to mm-hmm. like do a formal debate on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I yeah. I have kind of like a like a moderate knowledge of most things Christian, but like I really and this like with everything having to do with Roe v. Wade, oh my gosh, like I've just become the pro-life guy on TikTok and like, I did not <laughs> intend for that at all, but here I am. <laughs> right. And, you know. We just had a girl on uh, last week um, who's a really, really good, also aspiring uh, apologist who's Aish. really good at- uh, Yeah. Yeah, Aish, you know yeah. her. You know her. I do. She's going to be on, her, her episode will drop, by this time it comes out, it'll be the two week weeks. previous, but the like time we're recording. Now. Yeah, two weeks. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Just uh, check out her on TikTok. Her yeah. her, her stuff is awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's, she's incredibly awesome. thoughtful Christian. Yeah, it'd be fun to do a a four like a panel like debate like you two versus two other um, pro choicers. It'd be fun. That would be awesome. I'd love that. Uh, yeah, we just gotta meet some pro choicers first. <laughs> I can get. <laughs> I can find you some. I, I think yeah. I think that's possible. Yeah, I could I could get I could get you in touch with someone if you're if you're interested in that. Yeah, that'd be really fun. Yeah, look into that. Yeah, this was awesome. I really appreciate it, guys. This was super cool. I've never yeah. done anything like this before, <laughs> as I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> no, absolutely. You killed it. It was a great time. Yeah, it was a great time. Yeah, yeah. So thanks everybody for listening. Um, as always, you can find us everywhere you want to look. We're on TikTok, Instagram, uh, Twitter, anywhere you want to look, we're there. Uh, you can find Tate at the local theistic nuisance on TikTok. Um, and then maybe if one day if you create a, a YouTube channel or something, we can link it in the bio or something like that. Um, but yeah, check them out on, on TikTok. And yeah, we'll see you guys next week.